and excitement of March Mania is here. And DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into one hundred and fifty dollars instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code John J O H N. New customers can bet five bucks to get one hundred and fifty dollars instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code J O H N. The crown is yours. Okay, happy NFL New Year. Hopefully every team is in cap compliance (laughs) and we're off and running. Uh, I I guess unofficially we've been definitely off and running for the last couple days. Just created a little Twitter list of the Schefters of the Rap Sheets and the Pelissaros and kind of that crew to keep track of everything. Though, for the most part, the big names... Uh, The franchise tag guys, a lot of them signed extensions. So, I mean, we have a lot of clarity that there are still, I would say, a couple big names. Could something happen to T. Higgins? I mean, it might not happen right now, but over the next week or two, uh, you would say based on Mike Brown's history, you know, probably not, but you never know. Brandon Ayuk extension, could he be traded? The Chiefs with LeJarrius Sneed, would they just find a way to keep him? Would, is there a team out there yesterday? The Lions uh, were a team that I thought maybe trade a late one to get them, but they they trade for Davis from the Bucks. So, you know, a lot of moving parts, even though we have a a lot of stuff that's official. I I saw Kirk Cousins basically announcing uh, or or saying, thank you for everything. Very very classy gesture. It looked like he was at Augusta National. (laughs) It, It literally looked like he was in Butler Cabin. So maybe that came along with the contract. Wouldn't shock me uh, with how good him and his camp is as businessmen. He would join Peyton Manning as another quarterback as a member at Augusta. Arthur Blank probably a member there too. But we'll dive in. Some some stuff has happened since last time I talked this morning. And even late yesterday, the Houston Texans had a fantastic move. Uh, The the Niners did a couple things. So we'll kind of dive into everything. Very fluid time. And we'll just rock and roll, see what happens here. But uh, before we dive into uh, some recent information, i got to tell you about my friends. Game Time, the official ticketing app of this podcast. Go to your cell phone right now. Go to your iPad. Download the Game Time app. The Game Time app, official ticketing app of this podcast. Promo code John, J-O-H-N, J-O-H-N. Get $20 off. Promo code John, $20 off. Go to any game. I I was locked in last night to the St. Mary's Gales beat Gonzaga, which doesn't happen that often. Now it's the worst Gonzaga team in a long time. They're going dancing. I love March Madness, conference tourney week. If March Madness is coming near you, download that game time app, promo code John, J-O-H-N, promo code John, $20 off your first pair of tickets. Uh, Let's see. The Bears just made a move. One-year deal, Brett Rippon. A lot of moves in the NFL. I follow this literally for a living. I mean, extremely closely. I have to text people in the NFL like, who's this guy? What's he do? I mean, there are a lot of moves. I wouldn't say they're irrelevant because a lot of these guys are going to be solid impact guys, but just don't feel that relevant today. Now, ironically, that historically in free agency, a lot of the big names, besides retaining your own players, buying high-priced players for other teams, depending on who you listen to, or what stat you read, it's it's definitely not 50-50 landing free agency. So historically, this is not usually where you win a Super Bowl. You add a piece or two. Belichick and Brady did it forever. A guy here, a guy there. Extend your own guys, the Chiefs, Chris Jones, right? 
it's pretty rare that a highly drafted guy who plays well leaves Christian Wilkins to the Raiders. Uh, I, I would say there are some plug-and-play positions. Defensive tackle, I, I'd feel pretty comfortable if, if he's a high-character, high hard worker. Like, right? really, if the guy's been a really good player in the league, the only reason that guy might fail is because of work ethic w- with money. But a lot of other positions are very dependent on your scheme, right? Corner, linebacker, offensive line, running back. Some guys are more comfortable in zone than in gap power schemes. Uh, wide receiver, you're very dependent on your quarterback. So we got a lot of stuff going on. A lot of big names have been signed. I mean, King Henry to the Ravens. That that just seems fun to me. Now, is it going to work or not? Like, I don't have some huge take. Like, that's crazy or that's not crazy. I'm just glad that he went there. <laughs> like, I'm glad that one of the best running backs over the last 20 years went to a team that matters. And I, I want to dive into that really quick. I think running back, and I've been a proponent of you can't pay running backs. Well, this goes back to when the running backs, Zeke, Todd Gurley, their numbers were like $45, $50 million guaranteed. So at the time, you're like, well, in the next couple of years, I'm not going to pay a running back $75 million guaranteed. They're on par with the wide receivers. And then everything changed. The wide receivers kept going up and up and up. People are talking about guys like Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase being $30 plus million wide receivers. T. Higgins, Brandon Ayuk being $25 million receivers. Even with the cap up, that's a lot, for, especially the second two guys, given that, you know, are they true number ones? And I like both players a lot. Well, the running back contracts, the cap has gone up. They've gone down. So in the in the world of just position inflation, offensive guards, I, I've always thought you can get a starting guard somewhere in the late second, definitely on the third day. They're going for 17, 18, 19 million dollars. So you're telling me I can get Saquon Barkley or Josh Jacobs for $12 million? Three or four years ago, that number was even higher. They're going the other way. You go into the store right now, you can't get out of there with five items for under 100 bucks. I mean, look to buy a new car right now. They're fucking outrageous. The one thing I've always said, and I got a lot of them in my house, that has been pretty inflation-proof, flat-screen TVs. Go to Costco. You can get like an 80-incher for like 600 bucks. It's incredible. Running backs, it's kind of inflation-proof. Their numbers are going the wrong way. And it's one thing, like, I wouldn't be that big in, in signing a mid-tier guy for seven, eight million dollars. Like the, the Swift contract, I like him, but eight million dollars feels a little no man's land. I, I like the Eckler types for like more like three or four. That that feels really good business. But if I get a guy who I view as a top five guy at his position, who can rush for over twelve hundred yards and catch forty or fifty balls, like Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs, and their number is lower than all these guys that sign contract four or five, like that's a market inefficiency. And that's what I think you saw from the Packers and the Eagles is this notion you can't pay running backs. Yeah, you can't pay running backs that parallel wide receiver contracts. That's insanity. And you could argue the wide receiver contracts, you better make sure the fucking guy's an elite player. Because if you sign a $25, $26 million guy and he's not a dominant, dominant player, you're going to have problems. No different than these guards. I'm all for improving the offensive line. If you sign a 16, 17, 18 million dollar a year guard, that guy better be a borderline Pro Bowl guy. If he's just average, you're screwed. It's why last year when McGlinchey signed with Denver, I hated the deal. I'm like, you can't give a guy $55 million who's a turnstile out there. You, you can't do it. I mean, I, 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 th- that's one of the worst contracts I've ever seen. Not because he's not a function, like you can play with him. He's a starting player. But when you start paying him top of the market, you have problems. And these running backs no longer get top of the market contracts. So as someone who's always been on the one side of the argument, I'm o- I'm a businessman. I'm open. <laughs> like the, the numbers now make sense on the other side. And that's why I think you saw Josh Jacobs, who I actually think is better than Saquon Barkley. That's one of the best deals of free agency. Because even if, listen, th- there is a massive amount of risk anytime you sign any player in the sport of football because of the injury risk. That's more than all these other sports beside like hockey. And I'd be honest, I don't really watch, but you, you can get hurt training. You can get hurt in practice. You can get hurt in games. You can hurt any moment. But if I just, I'm on the hook for one year, like you couldn't assign half the guards for like less than two and a half years, 
fully guaranteed. So I'm getting a guy that can easily be a pro bowler for one year. All I got to guarantee him is that even the Eagles go, this guy carried a shit offense with a God awful offensive line. And we basically pay him what he's made the last couple of years. That, that, that seems like a pretty easy deal to make. Now, if you wanted to push back, could they have drafted a guy in the mid rounds? Texting around, this is not viewed as a really, really good running back draft. Like, there aren't going to be many guys going in the top 50 at that position. So you've had a front row seat playing against this guy. That's the other thing. You feel very confident when you've played against a certain player a lot. And the one thing I've defended the Saquon Barkley, even if, you know, $26 million guaranteed isn't nothing, but like I said, relative to a lot of these other contracts, it really is, is there's a character component. High-level guy on a team that's going to be missing some some of that right they have a they have a missing piece in Kelsey who was obviously the heartbeat and the team leader and Fletcher Cox who was definitely one of uh you know team captain on the defensive side a stalwart for that unit both gone like not on other teams retired like I'm out see you guys like that's that's not nothing anytime you lose a stalwart who's a pro bowl guy who's a legendary player for your team and he just leaves, there's a void. I think when he retires, that sometimes is a bigger blow. Now, it makes you feel good because I, I don't think they would have re-signed Fletcher Cox. Obviously, they you know Jason Kelsey, if he would keep playing, he's going to keep being on the Eagles. But I, I, I the two running back moves, even Eckler to Washington, I, I, like, I like a lot of that. I like DeAndre Swift. Eight million might be a little rich for me, but Gus Edwards to Harbaugh. It, it's, it's this year and last year, it's now the market inefficiency. It truly is. So you can be anti-running back and also think it's it's pretty good business right now. Uh, anything else crazy currently going on? It's wild. I I had I guess I had anticipated that when I was texting around with people behind the scenes, I'm like, we got to go live for this. That this would be the big splashy day. It actually turns out next year for sure. I'm going to do this day, but I'm also going to do the the day that the the tampering period opens because that is that that time is bananas. It, it, it really is. And it shows you. And, and I said this when I went to the combine and luckily no one's acting like anyone's tampering in the sense that no one gives a shit. Everyone's open for business. Come the combine. Now the GMs will tell you, well, we could talk to the agents of our own players. Well, those agents also represent all the other players. So all these deals are getting done right there as they should. It's the NFL convention. And it's when all this movement is put into motion. Historically, it's been a time, and just in recent memory, when a lot of these big trades are commiserated, right? That That's when Russell Wilson and the Denver Broncos and that whole thing went down. That's when Aaron Rodgers kind of pushed back against going to Denver a couple of years ago and ended up signing the contract. I know it was broken uh, a week later or whatever, but like that's when they kind of found out we have to pivot in in a new direction. You know, the future vice president. That was another move I saw today. Like the Chargers cut Mike Williams, which obviously was a financial reason and he's been injured a lot. Mike Williams is a really good player when healthy. He's just one of those classic guys that struggles to stay on the field. But if you go to his stat page, I mean, he's easily averaging like 15 yards a catch. He's a big play guy, big body wide receiver, good red zone target. But this is where the Chargers were. They were in a position where they were in financial cap hell. And they didn't have a choice. Kind of like what Buffalo was involved in. They had to make some tough decisions. You think they want to cut Mike Williams? Eric Hendricks was second on the team in tackles. But they had to clear the money. Khalil Mack, who I I knew Jim Harbaugh would like, they found a way to restructure and he's going to be on the team. And now I think all eyes point to the Joey Bosa situation. What will happen, you know, in the next 24 I think they have till Friday to basically uh, give him a big roster bonus. And that's the thing, like a lot of roster bonuses that are coming either Friday or next week, give teams a little time, right? It's why a lot of, uh, you know, a good agent will attempt to make that roster bonus before free agency. Cause you basically got to give me the opportunity to keep me or cut me because I want to be cut. If I'm Joey Bosa, I would have much rather been available on Monday than on Friday, right? There's a lot more opportunity when everyone's cap space is not filled up. 
And technically, nothing is quote unquote official Monday and Tuesday, but we don't see very often a deal, especially for a high named, high priced guy, get announced and then get rescinded. It happened years ago, remember, with Emmanuel Sanders, supposed to go to the Chiefs. I think ended up going to the Denver Broncos. But you would much rather be a player if you're in limbo of keeping your roster spot be cut last week or or Saturday or Sunday or Monday and be available to the open market. But listen, that's there's a give and take with these with these deals when you're talking astronomical amounts of money like Joey Bosa got. So he he became really rich, didn't quite have the leverage for that. And that's that's kind of on the charger side. The other thing I've been thinking a lot about this because obviously the, one of the biggest conversations has been over the last I don't know, two days. And, and we, you, me and Colin have been talking about this since I got back to the combine and everyone, you know, that was at the combine, it was for cousins to Atlanta. And I, I think the cousins Atlanta and the Carolina disaster is basically a reflection of the same guy at both places. Now they're different people and one's successful has been successful as an owner. The other is not, but these are owner led moves. And I, I, I've been going back and forth in my head Right. Is Atlanta, is this going to work? And I've seen so many different takes. Like, how do you give this guy this much money? Can't win you a Super Bowl. This is not in Atlanta about winning the Super Bowl. Because you're not going to win the Super Bowl with Kirk Cousins. This is about making the playoffs. This is about a guy over 80 years old with unlimited amounts of money. Arthur Blank is one of the richest men in America. Yet his football team since 2017, seven wins, seven wins, Four wins, seven wins, seven wins, seven wins. That's his late 70s and early 80s. Can you imagine being that old and that rich and having to watch that shit? Now, if there would have been 10 sweet quarterbacks on the market, they would have been aggressive for a lot of them. But Cousins was their best option. Do they think they're getting Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, or Aaron Rodgers in his prime? Of course not. They're literally getting a guy who you could argue had was having his best season of his career coming off an Achilles is 36 years old. But they were completely desperate because this is not about playing in New Orleans next year in the Super Bowl. This is about just trying to win the division and hosting a playoff game, something they haven't even sniffed since 2017. The other thing is over the last 15 years with Matt Ryan, he experienced a lot of 10 to 12 win seasons. A lot of years hosting playoff games in the playoffs, obviously the one year in the Super Bowl, that's fun. This is no longer about just money to a guy like Arthur Blank. This is, the time is ticking. I don't know how many years I got left. We're never guaranteed a rookie quarterback. We've seen it before. They can bust at any moment. They can be very average. This guy at least gives us a fighting shot to get to 10 wins. And I'm worth billions of dollars. So giving him a $50 million bonus I could wipe my ass with that much money. Yeah, it's a lot to me, to you, to 99.99999% of human beings. But to that guy, it's meaningless. And it's meaningful if Kirk Cousins can just throw 30 touchdowns and have us in the mix, either to win the division or in a wild card. If we're in the playoffs next year, that is a raging success. We are literally averaging under seven wins for the last six seasons. And any Falcons fans or any fan of a bad team knows That sucks. That is no fun to watch. The other thing is the division historically hasn't been that great. So it's like we're not going up against Mahomes and Marino and Elway. It's like Derek Carr, Bryce Young, who weighs like 140 pounds, and Baker Mayfield, who had a pretty solid season last year, had some ups and downs, has a new offensive coordinator. They kind of got the band back together. But that's who we're going up against. The other thing is, and I, I like the Bucks roster, but and I like Todd, but he's still Todd Bowles as the head coach, elite defensive coordinator. He hasn't just proven he's some lock playoff coach every single year. Dennis Allen, like, he ain't keeping you up at night. Now, they could be better with Kubiak coming over, running the Shanahan offense, but we know the Panthers stink. And I was thinking about it today on a a walk in the dog is this is what I think about when I walk the dog is why is uh, why are the Panthers in such shambles? And it's pretty clear, right? Most football people, they'll do some radical, crazy things, right? 
But for the most part, if you get offered something and you know it's a lot, usually you think long and hard about doing the deal. So when the Rams offered multiple ones and a two for the pass rusher, or even last year when teams were willing to pay a first-round pick for Brian Burns, I would imagine, I'm going to give these guys the benefit of the doubt, they at least were like pretty aggressive, like we should do this. Since that owner has got there, they have made the worst trades you've ever seen. Year after year, just wasting value. They have had no direction. And Arthur Blank clearly and meddled in a good way, like, hey, guys, we're buying Kirk Cousins. Whatever the number we have to pay him, I'll write the check. To me, David Tepper is meddling in the sense of like Dan Snyder used to do. No, I want to do this. No, I want this player. No, I don't think that's good enough value. Like, Dave, you need to just take a step back and let the football people run football. Because the way you have maximized players over the last 24 months is a fucking embarrassment to the National Football League, is an embarrassing embarrassment to the scouting community and general managers at large. Because to get a second-round pick for a guy that you easily could have got to first for, to give away Christian McCaffrey, now granted there were some question marks, but I would say that has aged pretty poorly. Should you just have kept him with your young quarterback? Like, you didn't maximize value with those draft picks. And I also think this gets back to them having DJ Moore under contract and not including him in the deal. But I, I can't help, like, there have been enough articles. I talked to people at the Combine that work there. This guy is a nutcase. And listen, I, I can separate, for, as a businessman in Wall Street, he's elite. He's one of the all-time greats. Since he has owned the team, he clearly has got involved in all this stuff and made it dramatically worse. It's hard to overcome in any business, let alone the NFL, when your owner is not just giving you ideas. All these owners give some ideas, telling you what to do. One of Robert Kraft's greatest strengths, if you watch that documentary, for decades, was like, I got I, this Bill's call. I, I, I believe in Bill. I think this is nuts, but Bill Belichick, let a rip. I, I wouldn't have done it. I told Bill, if Drew Bledsoe, if... If this Tom Brady kid doesn't work out, you're, you're going to get fired. This is crazy. Jimmy Garoppolo, I don't, I don't know. Over and over, though, it worked. Now, I'm not acting like the Panthers have hired people of Bill Belichick's football intelligence, but there are just some basic like, hey, we're probably not going to resign this guy. We probably should pull the trigger on this. And listen, you have an owner who is overly aggressive in that part. Why is Deshaun Watson on the Cleveland Browns? Do you think Andrew Barry and Stefanski wanted to give him $230 million fully guaranteed? He literally told them, no, I'm not interested. He didn't want to come. And then the owner got involved. Do you think they regret that trade? I got news for you. They do. And if he's awful this year, it's going to go down right there with Russell Wilson as one of the worst trades in the history of the league. So when the owner gets involved, and it's their right, they own the team. They sign the checks. It's literally their money. But what is the point of paying a general manager three, four, five million dollars a year, paying a head coach 10 to 15 million dollars? That's what they have expertise in. No different than David Tepper. Where's his expertise? It is it's in finance. So let's see this. I think I got just got a message. That I, I just don't understand why these guys can't just take a back seat sometimes, especially after they fail. Uh, we got a question here. A lot of Giants fans think we should trade for Fields. I'm just concerned it would be Daniel Jones 2.0. I talked about this on the podcast the other day, and I saw Rap Sheet came out on NFL Live that – the reason they haven't traded fields because they're still working on the quarterbacks. I like rap sheet. That's fucking bullshit. The reason they haven't traded fields is because the offers are what Mac Jones just got traded for. Trades are based on comps and his comp now is the Mac Jones range. And where else is he going? Like you could argue like there aren't even that many fits anymore. 
So you could argue the Giants are desperate enough. I think if you're the Giants, before you trade for Fields, you're going to see what you can manage in the draft. Right? You would. The problem for Fields, like Mac Jones, is their contract is up after this year. So you're trading a pick and getting a one year guy. Think about last year with Baker Mayfield. Tampa Bay, they didn't have to give up anything. They just signed the guy. One year, four and a half million dollars. So you get in a position where you have to give up an asset. And you could argue, and I, and I do, like fourth, fifth, sixth round pick, like the likelihood of those hitting. That is not how these front offices view them. Because there's enough examples of like, well, remember the one time we got this guy in the fourth or this guy in the sixth or, you know, this star player in the in the sixth or the seventh. It happens all the time. The dude the Eagles just signed, Huff, is an undrafted free agent. Highest paid undrafted free agent in the history of the league. Now, he's somewhat of an outlier. It was the 2020 season, so he didn't know pro day. But still, it's not like he would have been drafted in the third round. He still would have been a late round pick. And I I just think these teams really, really value those spots. And rightfully so, because that's their job. And those those picks are valuable. Uh, And this is the other thing about free agency. I'm just seeing that we knew this was going to happen that the Raiders released Jimmy Garoppolo. Remember last year, the Raiders gave Jimmy Garoppolo a lot of money. And he was a guy that, say what you want about him, uh, who, he was god-awful on the Raiders last year, but he had played solid football at times over the course of the last four or five years. Then he went to the Raiders, and within three or four weeks, he was benched. It was that ugly. Like I mean, you could argue objectively he was like the worst player at his position in the league. He was hideous. And part of it, maybe he's just broken down, whatever. But the, the plug-and-play starter thing, even at quarterback, like, I like Gardner Minshew. And I, I understand the signing to get a bridge starter. But if the Raiders are unable to draft a guy or feel comfortable drafting a guy high or a guy that they don't like or a guy they like is not there or whatever, and Gardner Minshew has to start all 17 games, he will not be as good as he was last year. Why? Because Shane Steichen is dramatically better than Luke Getze and the Raiders' offensive operation. So, like, I'm I'm all for signing these guys. And listen, this is the hard part about the NFL. It's hard to project what their room's going to look like at any position because the draft hasn't happened. But unless you're drafting really high, a lot of stuff's out of your control. And you never know. I mean, sometimes maybe you hit on a second or third round player in the draft but at, at quarterback. But I would say that's the percentages of that is pretty, pretty small. Uh, what else is going on today? I, I think the Houston Texans are a good example. They took a lot of shit when it came to what they did the first couple of years with Casario once Bill O'Brien left and they, they hired uh, David Cully and then Lovey Smith. And I, I was saying at the time, I, I don't think the average person on Twitter and media member under – that job was so toxic. I mean, they had the sh- situation with Deshaun Watson, who had every massage therapist in the state of Texas coming after him. He said he refused to play there. The The roster sucked. It was a disaster. And ever since Casario made the trade for Deshaun Watson, got D'Amico Ryans, now you look at their operation and they go, they got a GM who really knows what he's doing. They have a head coach who is an ascending star. They, I mean, have one of the better rookie quarterbacks we've ever seen. Will Anderson, I don't know if he's ever going to be like a top five pass rusher, but he's going to be a damn good player. And what did they do yesterday? They add Daniil Hunter, who was clearly one of the better free agent pass rushers. They gave him, I think it was like $48, $49 million, and 48 of it were guaranteed. So they kept it as a shorter-term deal. But they added a big-time player. And this is the one thing I've always said about the Cowboys. One thing the state of Texas, like the state of Florida, and the Raiders now have going for them, and the Titans have this as well, the no-state income thing is very, very powerful. When you're making a ton of money, being in a state that does not tax your income, and I know it's based on where you play, but you still play eight or nine home games in your state, means a lot. 
And I don't think it's random that Christian Wilkins, like that $85 million that he's getting in the state of Vegas, I mean, it's, it's a lot more money than a lot of other states, a lot more money than playing in fucking California. I'll promise you that. And I do think the Cowboys, one, just with their brand, but two, playing for the Cowboys, no state income tax would be a very, very valuable thing. They never have any cap space because they're always breaking off their own guys to huge amounts of money. And in fairness, a lot of the guys that they are signing, you know, the Zach Martins, the Tyron Smiths, the CeeDee Lamb types, Des Bryant back in the day, you know, worth paying. The Zeke one backfired. But the, the Dak situation is fascinating right now because his cap hit this year is like, I think, almost $60 million. Maybe it is $60 million. It's, it's borderline unheard of that – a guy ever plays on a contract at that number, but are you really comfortable with giving him $200 million more guaranteed? It's kind of that position Minnesota was in with Kirk Cousins. It's like, do we want to keep going down this road? And that's what I think you saw with Minnesota. Article yesterday about, you know, Florio likes mixing it up. This is what I appreciate. I don't agree with half the things he writes, but I do agree with him, you know, flaming the fires a little bit. And one thing was Kevin O'Connell was a big Kirk Cousins guy. Rightfully so. He's a coach. He's trying to win. No coach wants to lose. It's not the NBA. This isn't Tankapalooza here. Every coach, every single year is trying to make the playoffs. And Cousins clearly gives him the best chance to make the playoffs. Well, their general manager, this former Wall Street dude from the Niners, you know, he's a numbers guy. And I'm sure he's like, it ain't worth giving a 36-year-old that we could never win a Super Bowl with. Because Kevin O'Connell ain't thinking about Super Bowl. He's thinking about trying to win 10 games and get to the fucking dance, right? Just be in the playoffs. Like two years ago, when they host, they lost in the first round. They still had a very, very successful season. Won the division, first round playoff game. I know they lost, but how many teams in the league would sign up for that? A lot. When's the last time Pittsburgh Steelers hosted a playoff game? Last time I checked, been a while. I guess it happened with the Cleveland Browns in the, in the COVID season, but they got smoked. You know what I mean? And you just never know because coaches, it's harder for coaches to think long-term. Well, think about the next five years. Like, bro, I got a four-year contract. Like, I'm already going into year three. <laughs> think about the next five years. Like, what's going to happen week six when we're, uh, we got two wins and I'm playing the Packers who are five and one. Good luck to us. So that I, not when not everyone's on the same page, and general managers are thinking big picture, it, it can create dysfunction internally in a football office just based on the simple fact of these coaches are trying to win. And this is also the hard part about when the draft comes up about taking guys that are like upside guys or taking a big swing. Your coach better be on the same page with you because he's got to be willing to let that guy play through some of his mistakes. Because if he's not, then he's never going to play. And in football, you only play 17 times a week, or I mean a, a year, and most of the time you spend during the week is at practice. And then that would mean the guy's like running with the scout team. It's not actually improving his his ability to help you come game day. So this fraction, it happens a lot all over the league. Now, a lot of times it's healthy. It's normal. Like I, the Chargers, for example, cutting all these guys, like everyone's on the same page. J Jim Harbaugh knew when he took that job that they had some financial situation, right? And whoever was going to be his GM, they were going to cut good players. Like I, Jim Harbaugh would like Mike Williams, right? But financially, they don't have a choice. I think Jim Harbaugh would like Eric Kendricks. But financially, you don't have a choice. Sean McDermott liked a lot of those guys he cut. Didn't have a choice. Because come today at 1 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, you had to be in cap compliance. Sean Payton, he might have hated everybody. So I, that, that's probably a bad example. Eric Armstead's a good example. And this is the other balance. Sometimes a guy who means a lot to your team, super high character guy, someone that you nominate on a yearly basis to be man of the year, team captain, kind of not just leader of your defense, but one of the leaders on the team, stalwart on a team that's been to four NFC championships in five years. You get to the point where it's like, ah, you're making 17, 18 million dollars. You now have missed, I think it was five and eight. It was like 13 or 14 games the last couple of years. We can't afford to pay you this. 
we don't want you to go. But 17 million, that number for us to be comfortable has got to be more like eight, eight or nine. And that's negotiation. That's welcome to business. I never understood when everyone freaked out about Russell Wilson. It was like, how could you try to ask him to take less? Why not? You don't think he's worth it. So, hey, you want to take less? Say no. You're allowed to say no. You say no, okay. We'll go our separate ways. <laughs> that's that's perfectly acceptable. This, no one's for, It's not like this isn't the mob. No, no one's putting your head in a grinder and say, sign this fucking new contract. Or we're going to smash your brain. It's like, hey, we want to keep you, but financially, we can't pay you this number. The 49ers did the Kyle Juszczyk. They love Kyle Juszczyk. Been a full-time starter on the team for seven, eight years now. But it was like, if you want to come back, you got to take a haircut. No one wants to hear that, but then you get to make a decision because you can always say, no, I'm not taking a haircut. Eric Armstead, I'm going to hit the open market. It's his prerogative, and now we can see how much he can get. I'll bet he doesn't get $17, $18 million, but maybe he will. I don't know. Weird times. Use check went, you know, maybe it's more valuable for me to be on this team with this, the unit I'm on. I'm very comfortable with it. Take a couple million dollars left. I've already been the highest paid fullback in the league since 2017. It's 2024. I I can do that, right? He looks at the landscape, like how many teams in the league are using a fullback? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go from six or seven million dollars to four or five. But if you're Eric Armstead, his haircut probably wasn't a million or two. It was probably pretty dramatic. And I, money's all relative. I don't care if you make a hundred grand or you make $10 million. Whenever someone wants you to take less and you're prideful, even if they have a point, the most humans' first reaction is, F you, no way, I'm not doing that. And, and people know when they ask that it's, it's not an easy thing to ask for. But it's a business world. Sometimes you got to ask tough questions. And uh, it's why you see guys, you know, get released or get cut. So other than that, did I, did I mention the Jets traded for Morgan Moses, the offensive tackle, to protect the vice president? That, that They were pretty desperate. I mean, they don't have any offensive tackles. I always kind of like Morgan Moses, but you kind of bounce around now. I, I don't know quite what his deal is, but the Jets didn't have a choice. I mean, they just, they just their, their offensive line, I know a lot of people are making a big deal about this vice president thing. Like, I got news for you. Young, rich people don't go into politics. Older, rich people go into politics when they get bored. The young people that go into politics are usually broke, and they use it as a scam to then get rich. Aaron Rodgers is not going to be the vice president. Uh, I, I know it's a fun story for social media. It's an extra easy thing for the media to take a big shit on him. Uh, and, and who knows? Maybe he's a part of this. I know a lot, I saw a lot of people from the Packers that act like, this is classic Aaron Rodgers kind of forcing their hand. Uh, if he did, one, he'd be linking up with the guys that can't win. And, and two, he's just going to retire and, and run. Like it, it would it would be one of the craziest stories in the history of my life. I, I truly believe that. If Aaron Rodgers just quit football and became a, a vice president with RFK Jr., like I, 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 you could argue that's a top five story in the history of sports. Definitely of, of my my life since the 80s. Michael Jordan retiring would be up there. Uh, Tiger Woods getting in the car crash and his wife hitting him with a golf club in the face. Feels like it would be up there. Uh, something Tom Brady, I'm sure we could pick the biggest story from his career. So I, I'm not a acting like if it actually happened, it wouldn't be insane. The, the percentage I believe that it's actually going to happen is closer to zero than it is 1%. So, but he's a lightning rod. And anytime you put him in a headline, people run with it. I can't imagine if you're the Jets, you're like, what? Are, are we serious right now? Are, are we really doing this? And if you're the Packers, you got to be feet up. You don't even have to deal with it. You don't even need to deal with it. Uh, but it's just, it's always something. Now, in fairness, and he might say like, well, Aaron Rodgers ain't leaking in the New York Times. But, like, if you have nothing to do with a story being leaked, I always thought, like, the stories being leaked when he was with the Packers, 
about he wanted more, he was on them to do stuff. Uh, like that's come on, Aaron. Like you know that he's not happy with everybody. That's definitely on him. There are some stuff that are truly out of your control, right? And I I, I don't know, but I'm just saying it happens a lot where stories get reported and, and the actual player had nothing to do with it. Okay, before we get out of here, anything else happened? You know what's crazy, and this is where I also talk about the running backs, is that Hunter Renfro got cut. I liked Hunter Renfro a couple years ago. Thought he was one of the better like slot receivers in the league. He was scheduled to make like $14, 15000000 million. So you're telling me that a guy like Hunter Renfro can make... Now, he's not going to make that now. Someone's giving him like 4 or $5 million, I bet. I bet he ends up with the Titans. But... You can't uh, get these wide receivers, the amount of wide receivers in the league that just make like 13, 14 million dollars and who are average as the day is long. And then Saquon Barkley or Josh Jacobs, who I, I think Saquon's a tad overrated relative to like he's not the number one running back in the league, but I'm not paying him like that. And I'm putting him in a situation where I got a really good offensive line and I have a ton of weapons around AJ Brown when he's right is a top four or five wide receiver in the league. Devontae's a very unique player. Goddard's one of the better tight ends. Offensive line's fantastic. Our quarterback, even when he's struggling, still puts up really good numbers. Never forget, two years ago when Daniel Jones, I don't even want to say, Saquon led them to the playoffs. When Daniel Jones was the starting quarterback for the Giants who went to the playoffs, Daniel Jones threw 15 touchdowns. Threw 15 touchdowns. It's not even a touchdown a game in a league where it's never been easier to throw touchdowns. And people are like, oh, look at the receivers. You should, if you're any, if you're DC, you should be able to get to 20 touchdowns. Right. You can't have a game where you throw like three. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I get back to the running back thing. And I, I do think that right now that's the market inefficiency. And I give them and their people credit because eventually you have to acknowledge this is the price. This is how much we're going for, right? Like I, my girlfriend went, cause we got to kind of decorate the house. And there was this art fair kind of down the street from our house. And we didn't know that much about it. And she, I was playing golf. She, she went to the art fair and she was taking me pictures of the art. And it was just outrageous. Like, I mean, that thing is nine grand. That thing is 12 grand. I, obviously I didn't buy any of it, but, and then I started thinking, can I just complain? Like, that's the price. If someone's willing to pay for it, like, what am I going to say? That's the market for that piece of art, you know? So it's like, you can bitch and moan all you want about it. You're not getting that piece of art. And for a long time, these running backs were always so mad. It's like, guys, this is not going to help and create a solution because the market is established. This is the price. So if you want to play, like, are you better off bitching and moaning? because you don't get 40, or just signed for $27 million. This gets back two years ago to Le'Veon Bell, who I think recently says it's one of the biggest regrets in his life. I think it, he might have said it's the biggest regret of my life. I shouldn't have sat out that year. It was dumb. It was bad business. I was one of the only guys at the time saying that. Everyone in the media was like, yeah, take a stand. Show them, Le'Veon. Show the big bad people in management. No, they're just, they haven't budged then and they haven't budged since. It's the price of doing business. It's the cost of your position right now. Could, maybe they could change some of that if some of these guys start rattling off MVPs or whatever. But like, I, I was never going to cry because they're making 13 million and not 15 million. Like, I mean, what are we even talking about? I've always argued this. Like, I, I'd be very hesitant to pay certain positions this time of year. Because a lot of times it's when you sign contracts that you regret. Because in free agency, you have to pay a markup. This is not like you go to Nordstrom's and they're having a big sale. It's like, God, everything. I used to go, with, I remember school shop with my mom. She'd be like, oh, it's 50% off. We try to hit that rack. Like there's no 50% off in NFL free agency. It's all marked up. It's like, if this guy's $7 million, you got to pay 10 for him. Why? Because... A lot of teams have cap space. A lot of teams are willing. They don't even view it like wasting money. They're like, we got to spend it on somebody. 
And we're not giving, you know, this isn't Peyton Manning type money or Patrick Mahomes or whatever. So it's like, yeah, if we got to give this guard that we want, instead of giving them eight, we give them 11. A couple years, no one will even notice. But that is what you have to pay. It's why so many of the good teams that have a lot of players under contract at a lot of money don't really, you know, fish in this pond because they they just, they don't have the room, right? The Chiefs, Chris Jones, but it's not like they're in the mix for a lot of these guys. The Ravens never fuck with this time of year. And a lot of it's because they usually extend their own guys and they don't want to get into bad contracts. Now, sometimes you can't help yourself. And a lot of times it's because you've missed on people in the draft and you have a need, right? The 49ers who Javon Kinlaw signed with the Jets, I think yesterday or two days ago, might have been yesterday. Monday and Tuesday kind of run together. Javon Kinlaw was on the Niners because they traded DeForest Buckner to the Colts. Like, that was a whiff. Not that, listen, I would have traded DeForest Buckner for the 13th pick as well, but instead of taking Christian, or excuse me, Tristan Wirfs, they ended up trading back a pick. The Bucks took Wirfs, and they took Javon Kinlaw. And it was an utter disaster. It was an awful pick. I mean, a terrible pick. And the reason, last year they gave Hargrave Four years, 80 million, 40 guaranteed. And this year they've signed about four defensive tackles because of that situation. So a lot of times free agency is making up for bad draft picks. Defensive end, Drake Jackson, they drafted him from USC. He's been irrelevant. So this time of year is usually making up for mistakes. Like why why are the Jets trading from uh, Morgan Moses? Because when they drafted the big guy years ago to play left tackle, like that was a swing and a miss. That was a whiff. Obviously, if they could do it again, they would not have taken Beckton. They would have taken one of the other offensive tackles. But we can play that game all day long with woulda, coulda, shoulda. There's never, and I love doing it. Well, if we did a redraft, in the history of life, there has never been an actual redraft. We have done them, you know, on The Athletic or on some blog or on a podcast. But the teams have never like, hey, all the players from 2019 that were drafted are going back into a draft, and we're just going to redraft them all. That's not the way it actually works. And it usually, sometimes, you find diamonds. You get guys that you never thought were going to be good, and they become good, and they become stalwarts of your operation for for a decade. Multi-contract, you know, 10-plus year starter. And then there are other guys you know about two years in, and you're like, we're screwed. This guy's not going to be good enough, and we're going to have to patchwork this. And a lot of time, patchwork happens. Ideally, some draft pick out of nowhere takes his spot or free agency. And that that's where you kind of fill the hole. Uh, anything else here? Debo, not happy with Eric Armstead getting released. And then just a lot of other random madness. I saw the Titans... Paul Kularski, I thought he wrote Titan sign, uh, Joey Chestnut. I was like, God, the hot dog eater plays in the NFL? This is Julius Chestnut. So as James Palmer just wrote, any contracts that a player team agreed upon the last couple of days can become official. Teams may start making trades or make official trades that are in place. All 2023 contracts will expire. So, fun day. Uh, really fun couple days. I, I think the, uh, you could argue the tampering period has taken a little bit of the luster of like free agency starting, but I, I think it's pretty fun. It, it, you could argue it doesn't really matter because the same thing would happen if free agency just started today. People would have been talking the last couple weeks. So I, I don't know much would change. Uh, but I, 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 I thoroughly enjoyed the last 48 hours. Adios.